<sighs> All right, well, good evening. It's good to see everybody out tonight. Um, if you are newer to our study, we are in the middle of a study I call The Problem Church, which is focused on uh, the first letter that Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthians, a church that he had established in Acts chapter 18. And uh, we've been talking about a lot of the divisive issues that have been going on here. And so uh, go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're starting an entirely new chapter today. Last time, if you remember, I tried to break up chapter 11 into two portions to deal with some of the difficulties in the text, the difficulties that are rather uh, less common in the Bible, I think, than some of the more straightforward teaching that we have, uh, in my opinion, in, in chapter 12. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to try to address the bulk of the text today. Uh, can I pray for us? Let's go ahead and bow our heads, and, and we'll start our study to get tonight with a, with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bless your holy name, and we're thankful that uh, we have this opportunity, Father, to hear your word. We long to hear your word. We long to be shaped by it. We long to be informed by your Holy Spirit, to be energized, to walk in the manner of Christ Jesus. And so we do ask that you would help lead us into all spiritual wisdom, that we would continue to mature as it was the will of Paul for his uh, disciples, for his a church that he had um, helped to plant. It was will for them to mature in all wisdom and discernment and to live by the cross of the Messiah. Help us to do the same as we seek to understand uh, the unity that you will for your holy church. Father, I pray for those in the body right now who are suffering and under immense trials, especially our brother Rick and uh, the chemo treatments he's going through. I lift them up all in prayer to you, Father. You know them each by name. You know them intimately. You know all the struggles that they deal with. You know all the troubles that remain on our heart at this time. And so we lift them up all to you, Father, to heal our bodies and to comfort our spirits. We do pray this in Jesus' holy name and amen. All right, so uh, just a little bit of, of the background, just um, kind of catch people up to speed if maybe you haven't uh, been here before. This church is all about division. That's why we call it the Problem Church. And it was along various lines. Now, actually, I don't know why I thought about this until chapter 12 of the class, but I thought all of these sort of... Um, Big picture summary things that I say towards the beginning, particularly in the introduction, would be helped if maybe it was visual, right? And so I'm a visual learner. Uh, I think that you are too, probably to some degree, at least some of you are anyway. So uh, what I've said from the very beginning is that even though this is broadly speaking uh, about a church that is um, by Chloe's reports, by various letters that they've probably written Paul, um, divisive and, and dealing with a lot of spiritual issues, um, this whole book is really can be uh, divided along certain units of thought, right? And so we're trying to resist the temptation to take each chapter as its own specific topic and instead see some of the more broader points that Paul is making and the arguments that he's conveying uh, that might span a few chapters. And so chapters one through four, he deals with preacher favoritisms, right? And uh, going back to the wisdom of the cross and its power and ability to unite us in Jesus Christ. In chapters five through seven, the whole thought here, whether it be this man who had his stepmother in the assembly and the call for excommunication there in chapter five, or some of the brethren who thought their bodies didn't matter and so therefore were sleeping with prostitutes, probably temple court cult prostitutes at that time, uh, to some of the questions about marriage, whether there was a person who married, um, they had converted, and their spouses did not. Shall I just put them away now because they're unholy? And of course, Paul says, no, don't put them away if they're willing to live with you because the, the, the spouse is sanctified by the presence of a Christian. So all of this has to do with uh, sexual relations, sexual mores, and, and the marriage bond. Then we got to talking about liberty and conscience in chapters 8 through 10, particularly along the issue of idolatry and how to practice our liberty with wisdom there, and then now we are in this unit. I'll go ahead and throw up the other units there for you, but the unit we're talking about now is chapters 11 through 14, all right? So again, resist the temptation to read any of these chapters in isolation, particularly chapter 12, which we're considering today, especially because, as we'll see at the very end of this chapter, it's just a, a wonderful layup to chapter 13. 
that a matter of fact, chapter 13, which if anybody's familiar with any scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians, even individuals who do not proclaim allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, they have probably heard 1 Corinthians 13. They might have even heard it at their wedding, uh, right? Love is this and love is that. But that chapter is directly tied in to what he is saying in chapter 12 and only makes sense in that larger context. So chapters 11 through 14 are all about the assembly and worship. And then, of course, 15 is, as I've been saying, the heart of the letter, which is about resurrection, the gospel, and how he addresses each problem with the gospel. And then chapter 16 is closing instructions. All right, now today, um, we're going to be looking at chapter 12. And before we get into the actual reading, um, just know that in general, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, what many have come to refer to as spiritual gifts. That's what this chapter is about. And um, so something that you'll notice is, and maybe you've noticed this before as we've been kind of developing the context, the historical context for this letter, is sometimes reading Paul's letters especially, or reading all of the Bible, is like a game of telephone, right? Uh, when you were a kid and your mother was on the phone, uh, on the landline or whatever, uh, did you ever like eavesdrop on their conversation? Uh, maybe she was saying something interesting. Oh, no, really? You don't say. And you begin to pay attention, right? And you can kind of construe just based on one person talking, not even necessarily hearing what the other person is saying to your mom, what the conversation is about. Well, that's kind of the spirit of reading Paul's letters. We don't have what the Corinthians wrote Paul. We don't have specifically their questions in the way they worded it. We don't have their response. We get Paul's side. And so because of that, we can construe some of the context and some of the issues that they're dealing with, right? Now, the issue here is that we see that some with gifts basically consider themselves more spiritual than others. That there was now division based on the various, uh, for lack of a better term, talents that individuals had in the body. And they were already developing this sort of social hierarchy, right? That we happen to be better because we can speak in tongues, or we happen to be better because we have the gift of prophecy, and so on and so forth. Um, just to show you how much this principle that we're going to extract today really applies to what we have to deal with today, uh, really with modern issues, um, would be just sort of the hierarchies that we see develop everywhere, right? Is there not a sphere in which we begin to tell ourselves which are the most important to the neglect of others, right? Well, these are really the star athletes. You think about uh, ball, ball teams, for example, and the self-importance that certain players in a ball team begin to feel. Now, those of you who know that um, I'm not a huge fan of ball games, uh, you'll be super proud about this analogy that I want to draw. So I watched, <laughs> I watched a, um, a documentary not too long ago called The Last Dance. It was all about Michael Jordan and uh, the, the team he led the Chicago Bulls to all the immense, um, uh, all, the, all the things that they had won. And um, something that was amazing is that it can't be argued that J Michael Jordan is inarguably one of the best players ever, right? Even something about his personality, much like Muhammad Ali, he has a charisma about him that is uh, very attractive. But it can be also argued that, uh, especially it kind of made this point in the documentary, that a lot of the, just the level of success that the Chicago Bulls had reached under um, his playing really couldn't have happened without the contributions of Pippen and Rodman. That it took a team, right, to be able to accomplish uh, all of these championships. And so that's kind of the same thing here. We deal and we value talented people very much in our culture. We love people with talent. We love driven people. We love intelligent people. The temptation, though, unfortunately, especially for talented people, is to think more highly of ourselves and of our import due to our unique gifting. And so that is a problem that they're dealing with here to a degree. So let's go ahead and take that here as we jump into the text. Paul is going to say, or even earlier in the letter, if you remember in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1, you can have all the talent in the world and totally miss the point. You can have all the miraculous gifts you could ever want and yet still be unspiritual. That's his point. And so chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now, 
concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in or by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good. For to one is given, through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another work of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues or languages. To another the interpretation of tongues or languages. All these are empowered by the one and same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body which seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we actually bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, the miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Now, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts? and I will show you still a more excellent way. Oh, it just hurts to stop there <laughs> because he goes on to talk about this most excellent way, which we're gonna reserve, obviously, for the next class period in which we discuss. But hopefully you felt that sort of tension, that cliffhanger there at the last verse to show you how intricately woven chapter 13 is in the context of the issue he brings up in chapter 12, all right? So let's go ahead and talk about what does it say? Just uh, a brief exposition of chapter 12. All right, so this time, I want to home in on chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I know that uh, for those of us who, who have been Bible students for some time, uh, maybe your temptation was like mine on a rereading of this text, to kind of just gloss over this passage, right? But it's, it's, it's rather significant what he's bringing up, and this is where that game of telephone begins to play in, because we don't exactly know um, the contextual basis for why he feels it necessary to bring this point up. But generally speaking, he's sort of presenting a test, right? That those truly operating under the Holy Spirit would never curse Jesus, but instead say that he is Lord. Now, the first thing we have to understand in their historical context, what they're dealing with, um, is that their world is very different than ours, okay? The Corinthians dealt and lived in a time 
or rather lived in a time, uh, and in an area of the world that was more, I, dare I say, more spiritual than ours, okay? Now, in the Western world, um, it's kind of different. Our culture's a little bit different, living on this side of the Enlightenment, living on this side of modernism, living on this side of progressivism and materialism, that only what we can see, you know, the physicality is all that we see and there is nothing spiritual. Um, that's, that was foreign to them, okay? Even if you talk to uh, people, who, people who live in the West even, like even in Nevada, they seem to be more spiritual. Those in the Deep South seem to be more spiritual in the way they conceive of the world. Those in Africa and other parts of the world, they're, they're not as reticent to acknowledge that there's more at work than what you can see. Now, that's the world that they lived in, okay? It's not just everything that's subject to the scientific method. They lived in a world where everyone wanted to be spiritual, and even in these idolatrous temple cults, there would be people who had ecstatic worship experiences, who would speak in glossolalia, the, this, uh, the utterance of tongues, unintelligible languages out of this ecstasy in worship. They were all very spiritual. And Paul is saying, listen, just because you're spiritual does not mean you're a Christian. Now, that's very important, okay? He says, listen, this is the basic test. Jesus is Lord. That was the most basic tenet of their faith. This is what you say at baptism when you make that good confession, that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Lord of the world. Everything else is subordinate to this in a sense. Every doctrine, even of the Christian faith in a sense, is subordinate to this basic proclamation that we recognize Jesus is king of the world and we live our lives in obedience to him, in fealty, in fidelity, in, in, in subjugation to him because he is Lord. Uh, let me give you kind of the illustration of why this might have been difficult, not only in their world, but in ours. Um, so, and, and I don't know how much of the Midwest is really affected by this. You kind of see this more in metropolitan areas, particularly along the coastlines. But our world is sort of getting a little more pluralistic in its thinking. Um, there is the sense where a lot of people want to be spiritual. And the, probably the best analogy I can give of this is some of my experiences in Vietnam. So Vietnam is a very pluralistic culture is very syncretistic, the idea of taking multiple disciplines from various faiths and kind of meshing them into one. Uh, almost everything about Vietnam is this way, whether you're looking at the cuisine, where they get their spices from India and their noodles from China, and uh, some of the aromatics from France. They use French baguettes and bread in their sandwiches. They like French coffee because of the French colonialism at that time. Everything about their food is just a mixture, a hodgepodge of everything else. I remember spending time in uh, what they call the White House in southern uh, Vietnam before it was taken over by the communists, obviously. And you can go visit it. And what's astounding is that the structure is very strange. It's unlike anything that you would see because when you go there, not only do you see a mixture of Vietnamese or Chinese architecture, but then there were parts that almost seemed sort of French in its building. And then there was sort of a, a mixture of like modern artsy architecture as well. Just this weird syncretistic hodgepodge. That's really how they view everything. I remember talking to my dad in, in my efforts of evangelizing him. Now, he's technically a Buddhist, but I remember talking to him about Jesus. And, you know, he, he told me when I was trying to tell him about the faith that, well, you know, I believe in Jesus too, right? Like, I'm a Buddhist, but, you know, I'm cool with Jesus. He's, he's fine. You know, I, I believe he existed, that kind of thing. There was no problem there. You see, the problem for many people is not all of these spiritualism. The problem is exclusivity. The problem is any definiteness in faith. The, the, the exclusive nature of Christianity and to determine there is one way that, that God says you come to him and that is through Jesus Christ. Some are very allergic to narrowness and exclusivity and I'm sympathetic to that. I, I try to understand that. But here's Paul's test, right? It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, you don't curse Jesus by the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, what makes you a Christian is the genuine belief, Jesus is Lord. And you're moved only by the Holy Spirit to say that genuinely, all right? So that's, that's the first thing he says here. Now he's gonna move on in verses 
4 through 11 now. And we're going to talk about the gifts, and particularly about the God who gave them. Now, um, look in your Bible at verses 4 and uh, verses 8 through 10. He basically states, and this is beginning to get into the issue here, there are a variety of gifts. And here, specifically, he labels nine. Um, A gift of wisdom, a gift of knowledge, a gift of faith, a gift of healing, uh, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, languages, many translations say tongues. I think a lot of, interp- I think a lot of um, here's, here's my belief. I think a lot of translations refuse to actually translate it as languages because they're trying to be all inclusive to other religious leanings. Kind of like, why is baptism, which comes from baptizo, staying baptism when the word means immersion, right? Because they want to be inclusive of other forms of baptism. Uh, and, and thereby get more sales. Anyway, a rant over. <laughs> uh, but, um, but here we see, uh, your, your translation probably says tongues, but really just means languages, different languages being learned there, and then the interpretation of those languages. That's what's being uh, stated here as the spiritual gift. Now, um, not all the lists that we get in the New Testament of what are called miraculous or spiritual gifts are the same. If you compare this text with Romans 12, think 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, a lot of parallel there, or even Ephesians 4, some of the gifts vary. There are different things being stated there, uh, which leads me to believe that these are not hard and fast gifts. It's not as if we should come away and say, well, there are only nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. There might have been different other ways in which the Spirit manifested, especially if our Bible is Paul's Bible, which is uh, the Law and the Prophets, the Old Testament as well, where the Spirit did manifest itself in different ways, whether it is the artistic gifting of Bezalel and Aholia with the, the building of the temple there. Um, so so don't, don't view this as sort of a hard and fast manifestation of the Spirit. But there is a lot of overlap between 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4. Now, we don't know for sure exactly what Paul meant when he talked about each of these nine gifts. It could even be that he's actually mixing rather mundane gifts, you know, like knowledge and wisdom with something really extraordinary when he talks about miracles as a gift. Or it could be that all of these were extraordinary in nature, that we're not talking about typical wisdom, but a wisdom only received through the inside of the Holy Spirit. It could be that as well. I'm not exactly sure, nor am I going to be dogmatic about it. But generally, here's probably what these mean. I just want to walk through some of the nine real quick. So first of all, he talks about wisdom, okay? It might be that he's talking about some sort of spiritual insight which could not have been gained by one's own lonesome, okay? And he's already talked about wisdom of the next age or the age to come in chapters one through three, this insight about what the cross, however paradoxical it seems, what the cross actually means for Christians. You would have had to receive that by revelation, right? That this wasn't an absolute astounding defeat. You had, you had to have spiritual wisdom to be able to discern that. Then he talks about knowledge. Now, this could just be a general understanding of Scripture or passages, but it could be an extraordinary knowledge that's received by an individual. Faith, uh, not just typical faith like allegiance to Jesus Christ, but that kind of faith which is uh, enabling an individual to perform a mighty act. Healing, self-explanatory, right? Lots of healings uh, in the Bible done by Jesus and by his apostles. So we see sort of gifts of healing. Miracles, a lot of strange things in the New Testament. Exercising of demons. We have this one story. Forgive me, I can't remember what chapter it is now. But there's a, there's a story even when someone takes a handkerchief from Paul and is able to use this to heal others. I think it was in the book of Acts, obviously. Um, I can't remember what chapter. Um, prophecy. This is probably talking about spiritual utterance received from the Holy Spirit. This could have been talking about the Bible. It could have been a testimony. It could have been telling the future like Agabus. Agabus was an interesting figure uh, in the Bible. He's this prophet who operates a lot like the prophets we read about in the the Old Covenant. Um, Prophets who would come to Paul and uh, take his belt from him, wrap him up and say, Paul, whoever owns this belt... Uh, it, this is going to be done to you in the cities that you're going to go to in, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 20 and after. And so that, there would have been prophecies in this way. The seventh gift is distinguishing of spirits. And this is probably telling whether an utterance is actually from God or not. 
Now remember, they did not have a New Testament as we understand it, okay? So a lot of their teaching that we would call New Covenant teaching, this teaching on the side of Jesus, would have been done through prophetic utterance, would have been through the teaching of the apostles. But let's say you're at a church and an apostle is not there, an authority figure is not there, and they begin teaching certain things. First John chapter four and verse one says, listen, test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for not all the spirits that come out are from God, right? There, there's demonic teaching going on and we have to be able to discern it and, and test it. Uh, we see Paul doing something like this in Acts chapter 13 when he confronts Agabus. Um, when he's on an island there and trying to teach to one of the, the authority figures, Agabus stands up, not Agabus, sorry, uh, Elimus, Elimus the sorcerer. Uh, he's this Jewish individual who's trying to steer this person's heart away from God, and he just calls it evil because that's what it is. And then obviously, I've already said it, tongues is unlearned language. These people were not doing Rosetta Stone. Okay, they were not doing Duolingo on their phone. They had a miraculous insight to speak a language they had not previously learned. And then, of course, there's the gift of being able to interpret that language that you had not previously learned. And those are probably the gifts that we're talking about here. Now, the next thing that he states, which is very important, is in verse 7, all right? So those are all the gifts, and, and honestly, there's a sense in which those gifts are besides the point. Um, the real point, he says in verse 7, is that these gifts are given for the common good. That's the point. These gifts are not given for your own individual repute, for the building up of yourself, to have prestige in the church. That's not what the church is about. Instead, they're given for the common good. I think about that passage in 1 Peter chapter 4 um, and in verses 10 through 11, where he says, as stewards of God's manifold grace, as uh, stewards of God's varied grace, use your gifts to serve one another, right? Whether teaching, through building others up, through hospitality, all these various gifts, we use it to build up the body so that God may be glorified all in all. That's what Peter teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 4. And then he says that these are all apportioned by the Holy Spirit as he wills. Now, I don't know if you guys caught this in verse 11 and in, in the previous verses, how he keeps saying this is given by the Spirit. This is given by the Spirit. This is given by one Spirit. This is given by one Spirit. You know why he's repeating that over and over and over again? He's trying to get it into their heads. We are not in opposition to one another. We are on the same team. It's one spirit that operates all these different giftings and talents. And then here's the point. If we had to solidify the main point of verses 4 through 11, it's really found in verses 4 through 6. It's a very interesting way that he words the beginning of the giftings there. He says in verses 4 through 6, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are variety of activities, but the same God. You guys, you guys picking that up? These are all rooted in the one God. This is huge. Now, not only is this important because it's as close as we're going to get to any sort of idea of a Trinitarian theology in the Bible, now, it's, uh, we can't really say that the Trinity is being taught here because it's a little bit anachronistic, number one, because the word Trinity is actually not even mentioned in the New Testament. And it's certainly not uh, extrapolated and elaborated upon as we see some later church councils doing um, in the Bible. But there's at least, you can draw, a direct line from teaching about what they call the Trinity from a passage like this to what we understand as the triune nature of God. Um, Another passage would be obviously Matthew chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus very clearly here, the Messiah, the Son of God, is on earth. The Father is speaking from heaven, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit is descending upon him as a dove. Or even see the conclusion of Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 28, where he, he says in the Great Commission, what does he say? Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one name, right? And reflects that unity in diversity which is the teaching about the triune nature of God. Now, why is this important to this teaching right here? I'm asking you, why is Paul trying to emphasize the nature of God in his teaching about unity here? There are three distinct persons, 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and yet one God. That has immense weight for how we think about unity in the church today. That's what he's saying. We have all these different gifts. We're all wrapped up in one body. There's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and yet from the beginning they are one. They're one, they're unified. It's one God that we worship. That's huge for understanding the point that Paul is trying to convey. Now let's go ahead and move on uh, to verses 12 through 26. And this is where he begins to talk about the body. And I think uh, if you're like me, this is usually what I think of uh, in 1 Corinthians 12. Every time I think about a chapter in the Bible, I usually summarize that chapter with one idea, right? What's the idea or concept being promoted here? And I always think this is the body analogy. This is where he says uh, many, many members but one body, right? Now, um, to develop the importance of each member, he's going to use many metaphors. Uh, he's going to use one of many metaphors for the church. Now, when we think about the church, people who have been called out of the world, brought into an assembly of God's chosen people in Christ Jesus, we can talk about them as a kingdom, we can talk about them as the house, we can talk about them as the body. And the body is huge as a metaphor for the church, and we shouldn't pass the significance of this metaphor too quickly because, listen to me carefully, it is not just an analogy for how the body is to be working together. That's what we first think of, right? If you've heard a sermon on 1 Corinthians 12 and unity, you think of, well, what's another analogy? Okay, well, we'll just use this pithy analogy about, well, the church is like an orchestra, okay? Uh, We have uh, the woodwinds, we have the brass, we have all these various, you know, different instruments, and yet all in one harmony, okay? (laughs) Um, All brought together as one. And and yeah, it's, it's not less than that. That's certainly a point he's going to make, but it's much more. What would Paul, as a Jew, have thought of when he's employing this metaphor of a body? What is he saying? Specifically, we're the body of Christ. Did you see that? He didn't just say, hey, you, church, are like a body. Look again at chapter 12 and verse 12. For just as the body is one, has many members, and all members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. So it is with Messiah, We are not just a body, but the body of Christ. This carries significant meaning for the people of God who know that God chose Abraham, didn't he? He chose Abraham that through his family he would save the world. Through his family he would bring the offspring that he he promised in Genesis chapter 3. They were going to be his special people. And then he promised that through Abraham's line, specifically through David's line, He would bring a Messiah, a representative, who would sum up the people of God to accomplish for them what they could never accomplish for themselves, right? David, you're going to build me a house? No, I'm going to build you a house. Your son is going to come, talking about the one who would sit on David's throne. So God calls Abraham, his family, out of all the families of the earth, is supposed to reflect the nature of God. Then Israel itself is going to be represented, in, embodied in this one being, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now he dies, his body is raised to new life, and now significantly, those who belong to Jesus are his body. We are animated with his spirit. We are now the regenerated people of God. This is the Israel of God, the church. That is the first significant point being made. Now, if one were to ask the question, how do we enter through this body? Well, he says that too, doesn't he? He says, in verse 13, we were all baptized into this one body. And that unity in this body cuts across dividing lines in society. Uh, Turn with me real quick to Galatians chapter 3. I I, I don't normally do this, but I want to draw... Uh, a cross-reference here because it is, it kind of, uh, it words it differently enough that it sheds a lot of light on the point that Paul's making here. Now, it, it's my contention that Galatians is probably Paul's first letter that he ever wrote that we have. He probably wrote a lot of other letters, but the only one that we actually have, um, well, one of the few that we actually have, Galatians was probably the first one, that or First Thessalonians. But anyway, So he wrote Galatians, and notice how he words it in Galatians chapter 3, the same idea in verse 27. 
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, the Messiah, have put him on, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. That, that is a, a succinct way of putting all Paul's theology in this wonderful metaphor of the body. In Christ's body, seed of Abraham, all one, crossing all social distinction, unified in Christ. Make sense? Okay. So, after we understand that, then we begin to understand the utility of that body. After we've understand the import of what Christ has done to make us unified, rooted in the unity of God himself, good teaching, the truth, theology, then we get the practical application, the practical import of what he's telling them to do, which he says, every member has a utility, just like the body does. Now, here's something even more interesting. We might want to credit Paul with a lot of originality. We might want to say, Paul, that was a, an amazing original illustration you used there, right? And uh, it's not original, okay? Paul has heard, especially in his context, the illustration of a body being used to talk about how society should function, how civil service should function. It was very popular in the Greco-Roman world to talk about how society is representative of a body. Now, what is interesting is where Paul breaks away from that illustration. It's not where he is using an illustration from his time, but where he subverts it and transforms it for the church, okay? Now, in the Greco-Roman world, whenever they talked about their society being a body, they would even go so far as even the more despicable portions of the body, talking about the private parts, even those things, uh, we have individuals in society who are lower individuals who are meant to take up that lower portion and they're obviously lower, and there's this hierarchy in society, the brain being the best, right? What's funny is Paul doesn't do that. He's different. He says, no, 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 these individuals are not lower and therefore despicable, even though they might have a small purpose to serve. He actually contrasts with them. They would use in a way to talk about hierarchy, some were better than others, but Paul contradicts and subverts that he says that even the unpresentable parts, and of course he's hinting at sexual organs, okay? He says even the unpresentable parts, you know what we do with them? We cover them in greater modesty. <laughs> we protect them, right? But even they have a purpose. They, they need a protection. We, we need weaker members, he goes on to say, as well as stronger members, however they reckoned it. And of course he talks about weaker and stronger members in 1 Corinthians chapter eight, depending on the conscience and the understanding of Christian liberty. But he says, listen, all of the body parts matter. Now, as we seek to apply this chapter, that's really found, I think, in the, in, in the greatest summary of verses 25 through 27. He says, so that there would be no division in the body, that's the point, but that the members would actually have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The way that I, I've heard it illustrated in other sermons or in gospel meetings, I think it might even Brian Anderson who would illustrate in this way. He talks about, okay, so when you think about the body, you know, there, there are a lot of appendages and body parts that you actually have no consciousness of. If you're doing your job, you, if your body is doing your job, you shouldn't be conscious of your big toe, right? It's only when you're, there's something wrong with your big toe that you begin to be conscious of it. Well, if you slap your thumb with a hammer, what happens? Right? All the members come to it. And that's the illustration Paul is giving here, right? That we should have the same care for one another. That's the way we should treat each other in the body. Really, the whole point is unity and diversity. That's the point. And that's something we really need to hear because it's not easy to find unity and diversity. It's not uniformity he's talking about here where everyone dresses the same, everyone thinks exactly the same, everyone says exactly the same thing, everyone walks in the same way, they have the same job, they have the same purpose, they're all zealous about the same issues. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about unity and diversity. It's easy enough to do either opposite ends of the pole. It's easy to find uniform churches where everything's the same, where everyone's the same sort of homogenous age group, 
I've been in churches where it was only young people. I couldn't even imagine <laughs> what that would be like. It'd be very difficult. I mean, uh, it'd be very easy, I mean. It'd be very easy, right? Sermons all have to be pointed one way. You only have to be thinking about one demographic. That'd be easy enough to have everyone who feels the same way and everyone from the same walk of life. The other part is easy too, which is just being divisive all the time and breaking up and splitting and having different churches and fighting over every issue and making everything a salvation issue and saying, nope, we're actually brethren of the truth and so we're going to do this. Nope, we're actually brethren of the truth and we're going to do this. Nope, we're actually brethren of the truth and we're going to do this. It's easy enough to divide. But to actually have unity in diversity, different age groups, different cultures, different races, different levels of wisdom in the body, whether it's a newborn baby Christian who's zealous and thinks everyone's going to hell. You've been there, I have too. Uh, Or whether it's an older Christian who's by virtue of decades of walking with Christ, understands things a little bit better, is a little more patient, bears a little more love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. It's hard to do that. It's very difficult to think about every demographic and group and concern and background and life experience. And yet, when it happens, man, there is something supernatural there. There's something miraculous at work. And that shows the world that Christ Jesus is Lord. And we live that way. And that's the point. All right. Um, a few more minutes on the clock. Is there anyone who, had a, who wanted to share? And then 27 through 31, we won't go over that, but that's basically just Paul recapping before he jumps into chapter 13. Um, is there anyone who has a, a question or a comment that they wanted to share? Okay, that's fine too. Feel free to talk and hang out and um, let's go ahead and have a quick prayer and then I'll let you go. Father in heaven, thank you for this time where we could study about your holy word and uh, we do ask, Father, for that same unity that you had envisioned in our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to maintain that among diverse levels of wisdom and age and walking with Christ and diverse ages. We're, We're very thankful for what you have accomplished here at Brownsburg and we pray that we would continue to walk towards one another in love that all members would have the same care for one another. And we pray this glorifies you. We ask this in Jesus' holy name, and amen.